This game was sent to the channel by Strictly Limited Games. Check out their store for more modern releases on retro systems. Undercover Cops is a beat-em-up developed by IRM, released in 1992 for the arcades. And turns out that a lot of the people who worked in this game would later go on to work on the Metal Slug series. Huh, how about that? Anyway, the game would then be ported to the Super Nintendo, being released as a Japan exclusive in 1995, which was pretty late into the Super Nintendo's life cycle. And I guess that's the reason why it never received a Western launch, as by this point people were moving on to the Sega Saturn, PlayStation and gearing up for the upcoming Nintendo 64. Thankfully, Retrobit Gaming launched a localized release for Western gamers with my copy being sent to me by Strictly Limited Games, which is pretty cool of them. I already knew that Strictly Limited Games sold modern physical releases for retro systems, as I actually already have Cotton 100% for the Super Nintendo and Panorama Cotton for the Mega Drive pre-ordered and plan to review them once they're out. But it's still pretty cool that they sent me this game regardless. Anyway, the game comes in a Super Nintendo style box. I should point out that there was also a collector's edition release of this game. But the version I got is the regular edition, so that's the one we'll be taking a look at. I have to say though, I am not a big fan of the cover. As far as I can tell this is using official art from the original Japanese release, but it looks like it's been cleaned up in some way. Like, compare this cover to the original art and you'll see what I mean. One looks like it was colored by hand and is straight out of a comic book or manga, while the other looks like it went through some sort of digital cleanup. But that's the problem, it's too clean. In doing so, the art lost some of its personality, and I feel that's a shame. On the back of the box things improve massively, as we're now being treated to the original Super Famicom release box art. And man, look at how beautiful that thing looks. See what I mean about the cover art losing personality? This looks so much more interesting. Inside, we find the game, manual and a double-sided poster, and thankfully both the cartridge and manual use the Japanese cover, which does make them clash a little bit with the box art itself, but I assume they did this because Super Nintendo boxes are horizontal, while the original Super Famicom art had a vertical orientation, so they couldn't just slap the original cover on it. Regrettable, but understandable. The manual is pretty good, featuring high quality paper and being adorned with official art from the game. It also details the game's backstory and background information for each playable character, while also teaching you how to play the game. And surprisingly, this is a rare example of a beat-em-up where I'd recommend you check out the manual first, as characters have a variety of special moves which requires specific button inputs, so it's a good idea to check them out first. On my end, I actually took a picture of the special moves pages and kept them on my phone, so I could easily view them while playing the game and not gonna lie, it did come in handy a few times. The cartridge comes in a bright see-through orange plastic shell, which can either be a good thing or bad thing depending on whether or not you like your Super Nintendo collection to look uniform or if you prefer some visual variety to your games. Personally, I see the appeal in both sides, but I cannot deny that it is kinda cool having a bright orange cartridge as it definitely stands out from the rest of your Super Nintendo collection. In fact, even the bright orange box will most likely stand out from the rest of your Super Nintendo collection, so it can always be used as a nice conversation starter. And I feel that the cardboard quality is eerily similar to any official games you might own. Now here's the thing, I can't confirm this, but I swear, this cartridge shell feels like a millimeter wider than my other Super Nintendo games. Now, don't quote me on this, as I'm not sure myself, 
Maybe I'm just being crazy, but all I know is that this game always feels like a tighter fit on my Super Nintendo when compared to the rest of my SNES collection. And no, I'm not talking about the pin connectors, those are fine. I mean the actual hole where you insert your Super Nintendo games in. I mean it's not a big deal, you can insert the game and take it out just fine. And again, even I'm not entirely sure of this, it might be just me, but I just had to put it out there. If anyone else owns the PAL release of this game, please, please comment below. Just say something and let me know I'm not crazy, please. And finally, we have the poster, which, um, yeah. I don't know how well this comes across on camera, but it is kinda blurry, though I do like seeing what I assume are manga panels from the game's official manga. Thankfully, the other side looks much better. I mean, it's still a little bit blurry, but these are well within what I consider to be acceptable levels of blurriness. And besides, this side looks way cooler anyway, so I'm okay with that. Overall, I really enjoy this packaging. Yeah, I kinda feel the cover is a bit of a miss, and one side of the poster is a little bit blurry, but those are minor complaints. And this packaging looks great and would make a nice addition to anyone's Super Nintendo shelf. Booting up the game, we learn that it's the year 2043 and we're a police force known as Sweepers in post-apocalyptic New York and our task is to take down the various gangs that rule the city. And I mean, I said it's New York, but really, this could just be any city anywhere as I don't think you see any of New York's landmarks anywhere in the game, nor are they really mentioned for that matter. Which is honestly fine by me, because it seems that the developers were going for a Mad Max vibe and they just chose a city at random. You might also notice the weird viewing window. I mean, this almost looks like it's running in widescreen. Well, the original Japanese release already had these black bars on the top and bottom. And when you run the game through a European Super Nintendo, it ends up looking like this. I mean, heck, I can almost zoom in the game and fill the screen completely. Anyway, you get three characters to choose from. Matt the footballer, who's slow but deals more damage, Rosa who's a bit faster, and Zen who is the balance character. Well, I call Rosa the fast character, but really, that's a bit of a misnomer, because all of your characters are pretty slow if you ask me. Usually in beat-em-ups, I always go with the fast characters, but here, they move so slow that it just took me a while to get used to it. I don't know, maybe I've just gotten too used to Guy in Final Fight, Blaze from Streets of Rage or Alex from Paprium, but everyone here just felt like they were walking over molasses for me. So needless to say, you will not be seeing a lot of gameplay footage from Matt the Footballer from me. Playing him was like torture. The other two are a bit better, but none of them ever reach the speed I usually like to see in games like this. In fact, the game as a whole is a bit on the slow side, and I swear, this is not a dig at the Super Nintendo or Blast processing, it's just how it is. As far as beat'em ups go, this is a slow one. You move slowly, your enemies move slowly, if there's too much happening on screen, the game slows down, and if you want to jump, you're going to have a half second delay before you actually jump. No, seriously, whenever you jump, there's this odd delay between your button input and your character performing the action. Though the weird thing is that this seems intentional, as you can clearly see Rosa bending down before finally jumping. I know it doesn't seem like much, but it can really throw your balance off. And to be fair, the game being slow isn't necessarily a bad thing. It makes the game more tactical and I would argue more accessible. The problem is, I've gotten so used to the fast and frantic action of other beat-em-ups on the arcade or the Mega Drive that I kind of had to relearn how to take things slow. Thankfully, the game does make up for that with some pretty interesting moves. Basically, each character has a plethora of attacks which require specific timings and button inputs. So for example, you could do a regular combo, but if you create a slight pause between inputs, you perform a different combo. Throwing also works differently depending on which direction you press, assuming you use any direction at all. So, you can simply keep hitting your enemies, throw them onto other enemies, hit them, then throw them onto other enemies, or perform a pile driver attack. It actually reminds me of Streets of Rage in that regard. 
Though the fact that this game is a bit more finicky in your timing and button presses means I often wanted to do one thing and we end up doing the other. So there is a bit of a learning curve here. The good news is that when you get it down and everything clicks, Undercover Cops becomes really fun, as new enemy types and combinations keep showing up, requiring you to adapt your moves to each challenge presented. If you're the type of gamer who only performs the regular three hit combo, chances are you're going to quickly become frustrated with Undercover Cops, especially as you face off against the bosses or enemies that block you. But once you learn each character's strengths and weaknesses, things become much more fun. And it really is impressive the sort of stuff you can pull off. Like for example, each character has several different types of running or jumping attacks with different speeds or jumping arcs. And it quickly becomes a matter of figuring out when is the best time to use each attack. I mean, you actually have two specials in the game, one that attacks enemies near you and one that attacks every enemy on the screen, both of which will consume some of your health of course. On the other hand, something I've noticed with Undercover Cops is that you never see more than three enemies on screen at the same time, which is kind of the norm for the Super Nintendo beat-em-ups, but still a bit disappointing. Like, one of the main gameplay mechanics in beat-em-ups is crowd control, that is to say, using your list of available moves to prioritize who you should attack to kill and who you should attack just to draw them away and give you some breathing room. But sadly, most SNES beat-em-ups have an upper character limit of just 3 or 4 enemies, which is a shame when compared to the arcades or other systems which could have up to 10 or more enemies on screen. Though to be fair, the arcade version of Undercover Cops also has a low on-screen enemy count, so it's very possible the developers were just following the original game. Though it's also just as likely that they hit a wall with how many characters they could fit on screen, as the SNES version sadly lacks any two-player option. That's right, this is a one-player beat-em-up. Still, this does mean that crowd control in Undercover Cops is pretty easy, with most of the challenge coming from learning how to use each character. Well, that and the fact that it's quite easy to become trapped as enemies well on you. Rule of thumb people, if you fall down and the enemy is near you, press up or down as soon as you get up to get away from them. Do not let yourself become trapped. You'll thank me later. I mean, yeah, the game can be frustrating places, but it's also pretty forgiving. If you lose a life or even a continue, you pick right up where you dropped off, and the options menu lets you add a pretty hefty number of lives and continues. In fact, with only 5 short levels to beat, I actually reached the final boss on my second attempt, which took me around 40 minutes total. So this is a pretty accessible beat-em-up all things considered. But I think the real question is... Is it European? Oh. No, it's not European, it's made by IRAM, makers of our type and a Japanese developer. But follow up question, is it Japanese? Yes, it's Japanese, it's made by IRAM, makers of our type and they're a Japanese developer. And while the gameplay is good and enjoyable, the real star of the show is the art style, references and weapon pickups. I've already mentioned that this game is going for a Mad Max anime art style aesthetic. And man, look at this. I love how our enemies look or how dirty and run down everything feels. They really nail the aesthetic. But then you also have some pretty imaginative set pieces, like this boss who starts out looking like a wrestler, but then quickly reveals to be a cyborg, and you can either defeat him normally or throw him into a giant press and crush him, in a pretty obvious nod to the first Terminator movie. You also fight this boss who halfway through the battle just starts crying and beating your ass while sobbing the entire time. That's actually pretty funny. Then of course you have the weapon pickups, like you'll often come across pillars on the ground which you can pick up and wield as weapons, and these things are massive and so satisfying. They also start breaking apart the more you use them, so there's a definite risk versus reward to swinging them. I also like that you'll pick up TVs that are running the original art type on them, a nice nod to RM Seminal Classic Shmup. And this being a Mad Max ripoff, your health items are rats, snails and live chickens, which you often need to chase down to finally grab and gulp them down. Which is pretty disgusting, but kind of funny when you pick them up and your character claims how good they taste. 
that cracks me up. When you defeat a boss, you go to this assessment report which basically counts how many enemies you defeated and gives you a cash reward for each enemy you take down, which then heals up your character. And if you happen to hit the goal for that level, you also gain an extra life. The weird thing is that there are levels that I missed the goal, but I'm pretty sure I took down every foe on that stage, so clearly there's something I'm missing here. Graphically, I quite like the game. The art style is great and the sprites are big and detailed while being decently animated. My biggest issue are the backgrounds, as they often look static with little to no animation. Some of them can look quite nice thanks to some nice color shifting tricks, and the artistic value in this brown faded background looks really great. But for the most part, I do find that a lot of the environments here are kinda plain actually. Though perhaps this is once again an issue with the arcade original, as it also suffered from similar issues. Speaking of which, comparing the SNES version to the arcade original, it's easy to see that a lot of animation frames were dropped in this translation. Not just on your main characters, but also on your enemies and backgrounds. And the arcade version does seem to run a bit faster. But regardless, I do feel the developers did a good job at translating this game for the weaker Super Nintendo hardware while keeping the spirit of the original game mostly intact. Which is something of a feat in of itself. Now, what you may not know is that the arcade game was successful enough in Japan to warrant its own manga. Yeah, that's those panels where the poster came from. Unfortunately though, I can't seem to find much information on it. I couldn't even find how many chapters it has. Though I did come across one translated chapter and um, yeah, you're not missing much. It falls more on the humorous side instead of being a straight action manga. But the jokes are kinda not that funny and the art is kinda not that great, so I think it's safe to say you can skip this one. And believe it or not, there was also a spin-off for the Game Boy. This one is actually a mix of a board game with a turn-based RPG combat, so uh, that's quite the leap from a regular beat-em-up game. Overall, Undercover Cops is a fun, quirky beat-em-up with a surprising amount of depth. It's a little held back by its slow pacing and the occasional cheapness like enemies who keep knocking you down making it difficult to get back up. But what it lacks in speed, it makes up for it in personality and fun. It's not a game for everyone, as it requires you to learn the characters, so it's not a complete pick up and play affair. But it also does not suffer from the sheer brutality that other beat em ups would inflict on newbie players. So while it's not a complete entry level beat em up, it does lean a bit more towards the casual player who is willing to spend a few minutes learning the ropes. And in that regard, Undercover Cops is a very fun game and worth a playthrough. Now, if you actually want to buy this game, that's not gonna be easy. As far as I know, this physical release is sold out everywhere and the eBay scalpers are doing what they do best and driving up the price for this release. And the original Japanese release is even more expensive, so sadly tracking this one down will be difficult. So my recommendation is, play it however you can. Getting a copy of Undercover Cops right now might be difficult, but you know what isn't difficult? Going to the strictly limited store and pre-ordering a copy of Panorama Cotton or Cotton 100% for the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive and Super Nintendo respectively. These are two great shooters that were only ever launched in Japan and are now finally getting a western physical release courtesy of Strictly Limited. You'll also find the Mega Drive slash Genesis version of Mad Stalker, which I I've already reviewed on this channel, Wild Guns for the SNES, which I've also reviewed the remaster for the PS4, and Samurai Zombie Nation for the NES. But in the meantime, for those of you who get to play Undercover Cops, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by how well the words anime, Mad Max and Super Nintendo can come together when properly handled. Hey everyone, thank you for watching Stickage Retro Corner. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell and share this video, all that fun social media stuff. And you can also support me on Patreon, it may not seem like it but even $1 is a really big help in keeping this channel going. A special shout out to my high tier patrons Anthony Ryan Bennett and Jen Roo. Anyway, I hope you have a great day, bye!